Welcome to Inafune Capcom Edition. What can I say that's more relevant than what came before? Inafune rose through the ranks slowly, but eventually became the vice president. One of the things that he was made the caretaker of was Mega Man, allegedly. Again, this isn't true at all. Nobuyuki Matsushima is the programmer of the original Mega Man. Inafune denies being the main creator of Mega Man because he states in this GameSpot interview the work was halfway done by his own admission. But let's see how flawed he can be. Question. What did you do right with Resident Evil? That sold well overseas. On the other hand, Monsters Hunter sold well in Japan, but not in overseas. Answer. We were more successful with Biohazard Resident Evil. We made the lead character American and he speaks English. On the other hand, there's a risk that if we make a game that's neither here nor there, the game will be a flop, both overseas and in Japan. Now if you know anything about Resident Evil, you know that the earlier games had two characters. For whatever reason, Inafune implies that Chris Redfield is the only one, ignoring Jill Valentine, and somehow people wouldn't play Monster Hunter, but they would play Resident Evil because someone is characterized as American. Let's unpack this quickly. Resident Evil 3 had Jill Valentine working overtime in her own escape from Resident Raccoon City. We've had a plethora of female characters, and what I believe has happened from countless interviews is that a lot of people believe Monster Hunter won't sell in the United States based on Inafune's negative bias towards Japan. But the next few sentences should really tell you about Inafune. Question. So going forward, will you make separate games for Japanese and overseas markets? Answer. We basically want to make sell games that will sell globally, but some games might sell only in Japan. That's okay as long as we make a profit on it. Highlights by me. As long as we make a profit, nothing else matters. Gameplay doesn't matter. Bugs don't matter. If we make 10 cents more than last time, that's what matters. This is the context to remember when looking through interviews of Inafune. He is a businessman, not a creator. That means profits and quick turnaround are very important. As someone highlighting as an economist, look ma, no degree. I try to have an explanation for a person's actions. As you can see, Inafune responds to certain incentives. In all of his interviews, he's happy to explain his team and how everything went well. However, you should also judge a man by his missteps and failures, and for Inafune, those are just as numerous. We see that he can pass criticism to his team instead of himself. We see that Inafune is basically the Tim Schafer of Japanese gaming, but we allow him to take care of over $3 million? At this point, I can only facepalm so much as we move on to the next topic. Don't worry, we're not done with Inafune, but we do have to go into other aspects of the company that can be just as controversial. And who is more controversial than Dina Karam? Yes, I had a lot of stuff to say about her, but then a video fell into my lap. Dina admits so much and drops so much information that it was worth sitting down and watching more than once while taking notes, and I must have a curse because every damn time I'd put them on paper, they'd disappear. Anyway, minor research and gripe aside, I'll say that you won't hear her voice on this video. I want to pass on my notes so that others can use them and make their other observations. Use this as a guide for the video, which will be in the underbar, but here's my overall view of the situation. While she's made games and feels she owes a debt to Gamasutra for her learning, she doesn't quite have the skills to be a person who actually gives much consideration to what others want in a game. The interview was a way to whitewash her ego and claim that people should ask her for advice because of the life she lived. It also acts as an advertisement for Gamasutra and the art studio where she gained a lot of support in early praise. This isn't quite how a democracy works. Dina's merits are indeed a part that can't be taken away or ignored, but her personality and the issues she raises in trying to be larger than the community continue to remain prevalent. Dina would be an interesting figure were it not for her incredible hypocrisy and utter incompetence. This is the same girl that admits to enjoying using rescue plots while also talking about how she relapses in fem feminism. Again, Dina isn't the star of this show, but it can be said that she acts as a great connection from concept to the inner workings of the company. With her admitting that she has, was helped into the company by Ben Judd, this makes a great segue into him. Again, Dina is a symptom of a larger problem and talking about her here is to begin to see how the company has never had the consumer's best interests at heart. But, but before we leave the Dina topic behind, 
How can we solve her particular issue of customer service skills? Sadly, take this as a lesson in looking before you leap. Dina wasn't fired and set herself up as a gatekeeper. This works to have the company rely on her quote unquote expertise, but it also works to the detriment of anyone taking the company seriously. With a rich backing, where she paid for a fine art bundle and is commercially invested in Mighty Number no. 9, and no real interest in the company outside her own, Dina is a bad community manager made worse by what's surrounding her in the company. No, dear listeners, we're not done yet as we segue into the person that helped her get hired into the company. Part 3, Ben Judd. So let's begin with from the beginning and explain him, shall we? Ben and Nina Fudin worked together. This helped them become good partners in the future, but it also led to some interesting choices in the direction of Capcom, which has continued to affect the company. From what I've gathered in articles, Ben's first solo project comes from the Bionic Commando game that was pushed a few years ago. The hallmarks of the Inafune approach are here, and it seems that Judd was an apt student. The game was outsourced, increasing costs. The project was mismanaged, and as the project lead, Judd was pushing more for marketing dollars over actual substance in the game. Sadly, Bionic Commando was panned by the media, and no one batting an eye to the problems in production. But this isn't where our tale ends. Besides being Phoenix right before that, Objection! Ben basically gets us deeper into the minefield that is Comcept. So let's talk about him now. Does he work for Comcept? The answer is no. Does he work with Inafune? In a sense, but not as an employee. So what does he do? Well, it's simple. Judd is the Executive Asian Director of Digital Development Management Agency. This is a company that works as a middleman for publishers. On their front page are three specific tasks. Agency services allow them to find publishers to deal with and receive a fee for it. Consulting services gives them money to work with Patreon and Kickstarter projects. Finally, game production services gives them money to find younger students to create a game and charge a fee. Essentially, as a middleman, they charge to connect a publisher of a franchise with someone to create a game. This is important because you see the Bionic Commando model being utilized with this company and you can see its effect. Games are less passion projects and more about cheap production to make money quickly. EA would be proud. Now remember what I said about focusing on the top? We're going to apply it to this company and focus on the big four here. Jeff Hilbert, Chief Strategy Officer, Founder and US based co CEO, is more the brains behind this outfit. As a co founder, his job is to look for new markets to tap in. His work doesn't require much hands on, just effective use of scouting marks for his business and making it so that people believe he knows how to effectively market a game. Take the two companies in the Business Week article and look at what it says. Quote, his talent agency, Digital Development Management, represents some of the trader's leading game creators such as Slant 6 Games, the Vancouver, BC company, working on the latest version of Resident Evil, a franchise that has sold 45 million units worldwide and has generated four movies starring actress model Mila Jovovich as the game's zombie slaying heroine. DDM also represents Vatra Games, a Czech developer which is completing the next iteration of Silent Hill, a gloomy survival horror series which has sold more than 4 million copies and inspired its own budding Hollywood franchise, and Turtle Rock Studios, a Southern California developer whose principals were part of the team that created Left 4 Dead, another man vs. zombie property which has sold more than 6 million copies. So what they've successfully done is create a new market for middlemen such as DDM. But why are they here? That's on page one of the article. Quote, agents go where there's money and the video game industry is overflowing with it. Revenues reached 25 billion in the US last year, according to the Entertainment Software Association. That's more than double Hollywood's theatrical receipts. So there's money to be made in gaming. Let's dig into DDM. Hilbert won't disclose much about his compensation, he says. However, that popular games such as Resident Evil and Silent Hill have production budgets ranging from $25 million to $30 million. DDM pockets 5% to 10% of that amount. His clients seem com comfortable with the arrangement. 
So basically, they make a pretty penny of commission on the games that ship. Quality is not regarded, but finishing and pushing it makes them the money. Now the article has other tidbits, but we're not here to talk about only Hilbert. So let's give a brief synopsis of the rest. This article was done in 2011, so THQ's bankruptcy had yet to occur. The mismanagement of the company and having to write down millions was costly and is discussed. Secondly, the article works to talk about talent agencies for video games. Let that sink in for a bit. Because of those guys, games are being pushed not on merits, but money. And even though consoles are bread and butter, there is competition with smartphones and other agencies who make money off of promotion as Hilbert does. But let's talk about the other talents and what they bring to the DDM team. Now Minton is also a co-founder and US base. His discussion with Hollywood Reporter lays out exactly what the talent agencies are all about. We throw our annual cocktail party where 300 plus executives from publishers, developers, and financiers network in a relaxed setting. So what this tells me is that they spend money to make money. Let me explain. The networking is used to create new markets for their clientele such as Ninja Theory and Terminal Reality. Publishers get to pick and choose along with possible bids on the new talents and IPs since they're casually thrown about as the new hot thing. It's a form of speculation and commoditization that not a lot of people look into. If you want to know more, I'll point to Action Point's video about nerd culture which can help explain. But moving on, because they moved from the industry, they've networked and made friends while charging their commission as Hilbert's article showed us. I'll explain the speculation and commoditization later on, but please note that Minton also talks about why he represents teams over individuals as well as why he focuses on publishers. Quote, we know what developers need and we provide that. We have eight offices around the world from Osaka all the way to Sweden. We also do work in China and the Middle East and we're meeting every month with over 100 purchasers of content, largely publishers, but also funds and no other entity in the world does that. We have our finger on the pulse of what's needed in the business and we can help connect people together to do it. Let's translate this. They use publishers money to get more out of the developers than what the publishers could take from them as regular employees. One thing you won't see much of is a publisher that has employees like EA does. They want to outsource the work and labor as much as possible. By making it easier for publishers to move their money to different spots, they can find cheaper labor than their own employees which can cut costs but also undercut the wages of their workers. The finger on the pulse of what's needed in business, quote unquote, is basically seeing where the wind goes in the structure and moving the money to meet the publisher's demands. That's why they're so chummy with those at the top of the publisher market. So many people are focused on the quality assurance, music, localization, etc. to ensure that a cut of a game will be with DDM even though they're not making the game. This comes out to be a more expensive route. In short, Minton's article shows us the world of the gaming talent agencies, which increase costs of a game at publisher expense for the sake of extra sales and extra marketing. What this also does is tell us a bit more how the developers are left with very few tools to counter such advertising. How many employees are told about the distribution if they aren't part of that team? This essentially alienates the developers from their work to a third party that is more interested in the money aspect than the quality aspect as they spend far more on food and meetings with their boss's money than they do about quality control. One last article since Minton is the CEO. What the hell is a midcore? Well, according to Minton, it's the type of games on consoles where they cost a little but those have basically moved on. He explains, quote, Games that three and four years ago maybe cost six, six to fourteen million dollars to develop, most of those opportunities have gone away due to a combination of the recession, the transition, and the rise of mobile, tablet, and free to play. All those together have wiped out mid-core market. There's an argument to be made that a couple of years into this new console cycle it may come back again, but we'll see. So translation time again. Middle of the road console games have given way to new business models. In 2012, different models were being tried such as the continued success of TF2, League of Legends, and MOBAs among other games. Move the traditional types of game creation going on. 
The markets have moved on, and Minton is admitting he's none the wiser in my opinion. Granted, this is 2012. But how can you state that the cycle begins anew every few years, but not learn the lessons of past consoles? It screams of someone not understanding the history. Again, I won't go over the entire article. Other gems include how Minton talks about crowdfunding as a source of income, as well as, again, wanting to be the middleman for publishers while talking about developers as if he's doing them a favor. Let's be clear. A creator of a game isn't the only person in production, so this is a way to take away their investment into a game without their knowing. So we've talked about three people in this company. How about the fourth? Well, this one's quick. He started his own scam uh, business, which was as a certified scrum product owner and scrum master. Looking at the official page, this is basically a strategy plan for workers to do smaller increments of work than what they may be able to accomplish on their own. This essentially appeals to a certain type of gaming business. The EA is an Activision of the gaming world. Bigger places which have a lot of people want to have their workers being more productive and extracting value out of their work. I mean, hell, even Gama Sutra has something to say about this nonsense with the 10 things wrong with this quote-unquote product. Because let's be clear what's happening here. You're being sold a way to organize and make games with others. It's like you have a girl coming into your business to sell you yoga classes if you're a health instructor. It's not needed, but it sure m must make you feel better that someone is paying attention to what you're doing. The question is, do you really need someone such as these jokers telling you how to make a game? Well, they're a part of the industry and they're unknown for the most part, but they're able to make a cut of funds to function. Just as extra credit does quote unquote consulting work while not contributing to games, so too do these individuals add less to gaming than take more out of it. So in conclusion, with this company, we've looked at the four individuals at the top and here's my assessment of this situation. I am leery of DDM and I'm aware that more companies use them. They are a publisher expenditure to part money from the developers by giving them busy work and bullshit to attend to. They aren't idea makers who care about the company in the long term. We see that in how they help THQ. They smooth with the big boys to make the big boys as free agents of chaos and gaming. Be careful. For they are older con artists than Sarkeesian, and they are one of the many quote-unquote consultants in the industry. But look at how they field ideas. They learn how different publishers work. They offer an idea while claiming it was their idea. How? It came from one company to the next, and publishers work to make it their own idea when that's not the case. That's the main issue. But now we have to move on from these idea people that only pad their paychecks. Inafune's story isn't going to write itself and we have a lot more to get into.